we've been through, uh, we've been a community that has been through devastating defeats um, and government inaction and courts being very hostile to our claims. So there was uh, an appropriate amount of concern and nervousness about what the court might do. And then on May 17th, um, it's as if we were born again <laughs> in the sense of what it meant to have so much of our fight and so much of our dignity and so much of our humanity vindicated in a ruling that not only struck down the restriction of same-sex couples from the right to marry, but that in a landmark way, a ruling that we've never seen from any authoritative court ever in the history of the world, this court ruled that sexual orientation was entitled to the highest level of protection under the Constitution. It was everything we could hope for. And it was an amazing thing to be alive for, to witness, and to be a part of. And then on June 17th, couples all over the state, all over the country, began getting married. Really, really, truly, legally married in the state of California. Who got married? And as has usually been the case when we have won landmark victories that have forever changed the tide of history, we celebrate. And generally you're able to celebrate those rulings and those victories and use them to instruct your children and to talk about a future, to talk about a changed future, and then to move forward with movements and gains on other fronts, on other issues in other states. That's usually what you're able to do. You turn the page. You've changed history forever. It happened in Brown versus Board of Education. It happened in Gibbing versus Rainwright, a criminal justice case. It happened in Roe versus Wade. It happened in women's rights cases. That's what happens in a constitutional democracy. The court speaks, they interpret the Constitution, some people don't like it, too bad, we are moving on. What happened? Because that's not what happened here. What happened in California is before the champagne was even warm from our celebrations, we were defending that historic victory at the Battle of and does anyone here have any doubt how an election would have come out if Brown versus Board of Education had been put up for a vote? Or Roe versus Wade? Or any of the other seminal, landmark, historic civil rights rulings? If they'd been put up to a popular vote within six months of decision, we would be a far different nation. And Barack Obama would not be president. That has not been permitted because we understand the perversion that it would be of what it means to live in a country governed by constitutional principles. California is a little bit of an exception to that appreciation. And as hard as we fought to defend that victory against a tide of intolerance that we have experienced 33 times in this country and other states and lost every single time, we thought we could do it here because of the victory, because of the changed circumstance, because it was a new day. And many people in this room poured heart and soul and sweat and blood and everything you had into defeating Prop 8. And we know what happened. So when we woke up on November 5th, we knew that we had to challenge Prop 8. So once again, lawyers all get together, our legal colleagues, and Lambert Lee and ACLU joined us in filing a challenge to Prop 8. And even though it's this technical revision versus amendment challenge, it's actually very simple, and it goes back to the principles I was just talking about earlier. If you are going to put the right of a minority group, a fundamental right that has been afforded them up to a popular vote, you cannot do that through a simple amendment. That's our argument. You must do it through the other mechanism in the California Constitution. It's not like we make this up. You must do it through the other mechanism, which is a revision, which means you go through the more deliberative process 
of a legislative vote and then a referral to the ballot. Because what is at stake in Prop 8 is not just our right to marry. It's the legitimacy of the court. It's the legitimacy of an independent judiciary. It's the future of every other minority group in California, which is why we were joined by more amicus briefs, more friends of court briefs, and our challenge to Prop 8, than even in the main marriage case the year previous. Because everyone recognized how high the stakes were. So on March 5th, just last month, uh, oral argument was held for the California Supreme Court. It is clear the court uh, asked some very difficult questions, and it was, it's a tough argument. It was a tough oral argument to watch and to be a part of. I want to be clear though, even though there are moments when I feel like a ping pong ball as we await the ruling, I cannot imagine this court so tarnishing their own legacy by upholding Prop 8. I cannot imagine for them writing essentially their own obituary, obituary as the, the body that makes judgments about who the Constitution can protect or not protect. I can't, there is no rational, intelligent way to square the marriage ruling with upholding Prop 8. It simply can't be done. So, I hope, and as agnostic as I am, I pray <laughs> that um, to something, I don't know what, um, the ether, the air, the goddess, that this court will do what it did a year ago. It will find courage and strength and honor to invalidate Prop 8 and to once again vindicate the role of the courts and the rule of law in California. A ruling is expected any time between now and the first week in June. They have to rule by June 2nd. I don't think it'll go that long. Last year, of course, we were on the almost exactly uncannily the same trajectory. The court has to rule within 90 days of oral argument. That's mandated by law. They could have gone to June 3rd, I think it was last year, and they ruled May 15th. Um, I think they will rule late April, probably early May. I mean, there's no, I'm just reading the keywords here. No one knows for sure, but I think it would be a relatively quick ruling. Um, and I don't know what the court will do, but I know that if property is upheld, it will be a tragedy. And it will be a very dark day for us and for everyone committed to progressive values and the kind of state that we know we lived in for a moment and saw the possibility of what it could mean and what it means we, because we lived it and because we felt it we have to be there again we have to get it back so if the court invalidates Prop 8 we like send them candy <laughs> champagne very, very nice letters, flowers. You do whatever you can to make sure that this court is communicated with in terms of the gratitude that we feel for them upholding our dignity and the dignity of anyone who could be attacked by majoritarian interests and their own legitimacy and the rule of law. If the court in that way, if the court upholds Prop 8, we're going to be upset. And, and we have a right to be upset because the day has passed when it's okay to say you don't matter as much as your neighbors or your relationship is not as valuable as somebody else's relationship. That's not okay anymore. And we're not going to be nice about it. We're not going to be violent, of course. We're not going to hurt people. But we're not going to be quiet. And we're not going to tolerate that kind of demeaning place that we have so long lived in finally came out of and now would be pushed back into again. So the work that has to be done to change hearts and minds, it's not that many hearts and minds, 350,000 voters separate us from upholding Prop 8 or being 
Prop 8. And the questions we're going to decide later tonight are strategy questions and talk about well, how do we do it, what which of the things should we be thinking about as we decide to move forward. But there is not a person here if the court upholds Prop 8 who can sit silent any longer. And I know many of you already are speaking out every single day, having difficult conversations, risking your privilege. We know what it means to win. And we know what it feels like. And we know how young people in this country felt, and in this state felt, to feel like the government really was going to treat them the same and fairly and equally. And the obligation we have is to have that day back in California again. Thank you.